Good morning. Um, <clears throat> thank you for coming here. And um, this is, again, my, I think my second visit for CRPS to Denver. <clears throat> my name is Pradeep Chopra. I'm a pain medicine specialist. Um, I don't have any conflict, um, financial or otherwise, um, to this. We will be talking a lot about off-label use of medicines. <clears throat> and of course, obviously discuss them with your physician before you decide to try them. Um, in the interest of the, uh, disclosure, I am a pain specialist. Uh, I teach at Brown Medical School, and I have a special interest in complex pain conditions in adults and children. Um, so before I go on, uh, my presentation has <clears throat> these little dots, uh, just like Bob Lane's dots. My dots are a little different. The green means it's an effective treatment. It's been, like, we know that it does work. Um, yellow is worth trying. That means it's worth trying it. There's no harm in trying it. At worst, it won't help. At best, it'll help. Red is something that I don't recommend. <clears throat> uh, and the blue part is science. You can glaze over that part. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about CRPS and some of the newer thoughts behind CR, why people get CRPS. The first question I, know, I need, to, need you to know is, how do you know if you have CRPS? Because approximately 20% of patients that I see come in with a, coming in with a diagnosis of CRPS don't meet the criteria for CRPS. And I think there are two reasons for it. One is that they had CRPS at some point, but the condition has evolved and it no longer presents with the classical symptoms of CRPS. Um, and the other explanation is that they have something else going on, but we're told that this is CRPS. I don't know what this is, this is probably CRPS. Uh, and so they go down that rabbit hole of looking for a cure for CRPS. So <clears throat> I need you to know what CRPS is, how to identify it. So look for features of CRPS yourself, okay? And I mean, obviously your doctor is gonna look for it, but also look for it yourself to make sure like it does make sense because you know your body better than anyone else does. Um, the RSDSA website is a good place to start. There's lots of great information on it. Um, remember, CRPS can mimic other conditions. It's a nerve pain condition, so it can mimic other conditions. <clears throat> now, although we don't know what causes CRPS, but the question is, it's not because it's a mysterious disease. It's just that we haven't found a cause. And one of the things that we are starting to, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in detail, um, that what are the likely causes of somebody having CRPS? Because remember, one of the things about pain management is you have to find what's broken and fix it. Everything else is a band-aid. We have to get into disease-modifying agents. Uh, if you have a fracture, I can give somebody boat loads of morphine, that's not gonna fix a fracture unless I cast it. And that's how pain medicine works. So we really need to be digging into the cause of CRPS, and I'll try, I'll try and touch on some of them. So how do you diagnose CRPS? It usually starts in one limb, but it can be anywhere. It can actually start on the face or the chest or the abdomen. Um, it can, it is a constant pain, that's the key thing. It's a constant pain, it never ever goes down to zero. Um, it, and they are spontaneous intermittent exacerbations. So at times it'll shoot up on its own. There's color difference, there's swelling, there's, the area of pain is much larger. So you might have a small you know, injury in your finger, but the pain is in the entire arm. So this is to show you color difference, and you can see this hand is a dark rather than the left hand. Uh, this is to show you hair growth changes. So the hair grows darker and it's coarser. Not everyone has this, it's in some cases. Um, swelling, the swelling comes and goes. It's usually in the early stages. And of course, there's color change, you can see that there. This is another example, patients develop swelling. So you can see the swelling. The swelling you can make out because there are no bones. You can't see any bones here. And then the nails become brittle and they start to break off. Um, this is another, sample example of uh, swelling and color change that you can see. So it's very obvious. The color difference is very obvious. Uh, these things are very obvious, but the problem is that there's no test that can determine, determine CRPS. So there's no gold standard test, no x-rays, MRIs. Um, very often you'll get this pushback saying, oh, the three-phase bone scan, or the triple-phase bone scan was normal, therefore you don't have CRPS. Um, that's not true. 
the radiologists themselves have said that's not true. Um, sometimes they'll get a nerve block, a sympathetic nerve block, and if they don't get any relief from it, um, then it's considered like, oh, you don't have CRPS. That, again, is not true. And there's a lot of explanations behind it. But your physician could a ask for these tests in case he has or she has any questions, like any doubts if they want to rule out something else. So the best way to diagnose CRPS is to examine the patient. And it should, be, it should meet the criteria. The criteria for CRPS is very definite. You have to meet A, B, C, and D before you can, it can be called CRPS. And I showed you some of them. So the question is, why is it so difficult to treat CRPS? What's so special about CRPS that we can't, we can't find a cure? So why this is to explain, central sensitization to explain, is to explain the, why is it such a painful condition and why doesn't it stop hurting? Central sensitization means that when the brain and the spinal cord becomes sensitized, so a simple touch on your arm can become extremely painful. To, just to give you an idea what it means is, so this is a picture of the brain and the spinal cord, and these are the nerves that come out from the spinal cord. And when one of the nerves becomes painful, so for example, if I stick a pin in my finger, it becomes painful, so that nerve gets upset, gets angry, sends a signal up the spinal cord into the brain. Um, once I pull the pin out, that nerve goes, is happy, there's nothing else going on, everybody's doing their own business. Um, <coughs> Now, but if I take a pen and I keep sticking it again and again, or whatever, for whatever reason, the nerve is inflamed constantly, then there's a barrage of pain signals that go up and down the spine. So there are signals that travel up the, up the nerve into the spinal cord, up to the brain. The brain then sends signals down, and this constant traffic of signals going up and down is what is called central sensitization. So the brain and the spinal cord, known as the central nervous system, becomes sensitized and it's, this is central sensitization. If there's anything that explains pain, chronic pain, this is one of them. So essentially, when everything becomes sensitized, then every nerve starts to hurt. So you know how you talk about spread, how oh, the CRP started in my left arm, and now my right arm has similar symptoms, or loud sounds bother it, or bright lights make my pain worse? That's all part of central sensitization because what happens is if a signal comes from here, which might be, let's say, sound is coming from your ear, that signal when it gets into the spinal cord and the brain gets dialed up. It becomes magnified. So the reason I, say, I brought this up was because I want to tell you that the problem is not with the nerve here. I can do anything to this nerve. I can cut it. I can do anything to it. It won't solve the problem. The problem is over here. We need to fix that. The problem is with the brain and the spinal cord. So what really happens if you put that brain under a microscope and see like, okay, what's going on over here? Why, why is the brain getting all sensitized? We need to talk about glial cells, and I'm gonna to touch on that in a, in a little bit. So every nerve, so this is a brain, nerve in the brain, and around that, these are these spider-looking cells called glial cells. These glial cells are actually, make up 70% of your brain. And for the longest time, we didn't know what glial cells do, but now we know that they are part of your immune function. So remember that word, immune function. It's gonna come up a lot in this talk today. Um, so these cells are part of the immune function, and for some reason, these glial cells get angry. They get activated, and when they get activated, they make the nerves inflamed. And the question is, why are these glial cells getting activated? And that's part of the immune system. So again, to explain to you, so these are the nerves, this is the nerve, these are the glial cells that pack these nerves around. When they, get, when they get activated, they start to release chemicals. These chemicals then inflame the nerve, and the nerve gets inflamed. So it's these chemicals, these fiery, chemi fiery chemicals cause these nerves to get inflamed. <clears throat> and that's called neuroinflammation. <clears throat> So again, the problem, if you, if you really want to drill deeper down into this, the problem is actually with the glial cells, not the nerve. I can, do, I can put all kinds of things on this nerve, it's not gonna help, till I get these guys, the glial cells, to quiet down. Now the glial cells are part of the immune system. So treating the inflammation means managing, it's, it's figuring out what's causing these nerves to get inflamed, and we know that 
Inflammation of the nerve is caused by the glial cells, which means things like nerve blocks don't work. Oh, I got relief for a day, I got relief for two days. That's not working, so nerve blocks don't work. Um, there's a bit of controversy. I don't like spinal cord stimulators. Spinal cord stimulators are the same thing. They work on the nerves. But what we really need to do is we should be working back on these guys, these glial cells. But spinal cord stimulators, nerve blocks, don't do anything to these glial cells. So <clears throat> coming to the management of CRPS, um, Bob Lane asked me to talk about how to find a doctor <laughs> to treat CRPS. Um, now, so you see a special, and I kind of thought about it long and hard. So you see a specialist who treats CRPS, not someone who says, oh, it's, BRC, I don't know, it's probably CRPS, I'm not sure, gives you a pres prescription for gabapentin and sends you home. No, you need to find a doctor who really understands CRPS. Firstly, be able to make the diagnosis, should meet the criteria for CRPS, then go on to treating it, not just somebody who, you know, kind of eyeballs your leg and says, ah, I think it's CRPS. So it should, the doctor should have a well-rounded approach. It should not be somebody who's pushing, has an agenda, a secret agenda, is pushing some sort of a snake oil remedy or just spinal cord stimulators or just ketamine. Or, you know, if you don't get this treatment, I can't treat you. That's not how it works. All of these, it's a whole, it's a holistic approach to treating the patient with CRPS. Now, usually pain medicine specialists are trained to treat CRPS. Well, at least identify CRPS and treat them. Um, of all the, there are several different board certifications in pain medicine. The ones that I know is the anesthesia-based. Uh, they, because I went through the training, so I know how rigorous it was. So somebody who's board certified in pain medicine is your best approach. Somebody who has done a fellowship in pain medicine. Now. This is something that I've added in for the first time. There is a strong possibility that CRPS type one, so there are two types, the type one and type two, but type one might be because of an autoimmune dysfunction. So because in the last decade or so, we have seen a spike in autoimmune conditions. It's just amazing how our environment has, is changing so rapidly. I think we're paying the price of all our altered foods and the air that we breathe or whatever. We're paying the price for that now and our immune system is now starting to react. <clears throat> so we're seeing a lot of uh, autoimmune conditions coming up. An autoimmune condition is when your own immune system, your, when your own defense mechanism, your own antibodies work against you. They, try, they, they destroy your own cells. When they, when they start doing that, that's what causes the glial cells to get inflamed. Remember I told you the glial cells are part of the immune system. So the question is, would consulting an immunologist make a difference? I think it's worth talking to an immunologist and saying, listen, it's not about CRPS, it's about finding out, do you think I have an immune condition? Do you think I have an autoimmune dysfunction? And I just found out this morning there's a really nice group of immunologists in Denver right now um, who actually do think out of the box. You need an immunologist who can think out of the box. Um, the reason I said that is because among the autoimmune conditions, there are only so many antibodies we can test. There's a whole slew of antibodies we don't even know exist. There's a lot about the immune system that we don't know. So it has to be, it's not like, okay, I just ran a whole blood panel, you don't have a funky antibody, that means it's not an immune condition. That's not true, we're seeing a lot of patients who have some kind of an immune condition we can't find out on a blood test, uh, and so it's worth talking to an immunologist. <coughs> So in the management of CRPS, there are different steps. The first step is to confirm whether it's CRPS or not, which you yourself can do and your physician can do. Um, the next step is to figure out if it's CRPS one or CRPS two. And this I'll explain to you in detail because that's a game changer, whether it's CRPS one or CRPS two. In CRPS one, we don't know exactly what nerve is damaged. So if I have CRPS of the left hand, I'm not quite sure which nerve, it, it's a diffuse kind of a problem. In CRPS type two, there's a very specific nerve. The, say in the left arm, there's a brachial plexus. The, arm, the, the nerve going down my arm is damaged. That was the first CRPS that was actually discovered in the Civil War. These soldiers were getting gunshot wounds to their nerve which goes down their arm and that's how it was. So CRPS two was the first CRPS to be discovered. Some of the treatments are the same to both. But in CRPS type two, there are a couple of things different. One is, 
if there is a nerve damage, and if we can go and fix that, it might make the CRPS go away or at least get better. The second thing is CRPS type 2 will not spread. It doesn't cause as much central sensitization. So in terms of CRPS1, like I said, um, we don't know why some people get CRPS1. But with the thinking is now is, is more skewed towards thinking that it's more of an autoimmune condition. Because a lot of these patients with CRPS1 have GI issues. They have issues with reactivity to foods and things like that. We're starting to see that now. So let's talk about CRPS type 2 for a second. <coughs> So a careful, now this, to differentiate between CRPS type 1 and CRPS type 2 will depend on the doctor. They need to get a clear history and find out. And this has been lots of times when I've had patients come in with being diagnosed with CRPS and then you find out that it's not 1, it's 2. Um, so it's essential to know that. So maybe next time ask your physician, do you think it could be type 2? Now, so I'll give you some examples of CRPS type 2 in the arms. Uh, you can have what is called a thoracic outlet syndrome or ulnar nerve entrapment. In the leg, it can be a pinched nerve or tarsal tunnel syndrome. Um, in, in some patients, um, both adults and kids, we've seen joint hypermobility. So their joints are very, they're, very, they're double jointed. Their joints are very loose. So when they move their joints, they actually stretch their nerves. And that can cause CRPS type 2. <coughs> So this is what thoracic outlet syndrome pain looks like. It, classical pain going down the arm. Um, and this is as a result of compression of nerves in the, so this, there are nerves that come out from here and then they go, come out from my neck and they go down my arm and these nerves get pinched over there and that's called, that causes what's called thoracic outlet syndrome. And so in this case, obviously the treatment would be the, for thoracic outlet syndrome, which is first thing they do is do a Botox injection and if that doesn't work, then they do surgery. So this is where the difference comes in between two and one. <clears throat> Another example of CRPS type two in the leg is uh, there's a nerve that lives right below the knee. It's on the side of my leg, on the side, outside of my leg. And oftentimes that nerve gets damaged. Um, it could be an injury, direct injury to the nerve. It could be a damage to this joint or it could be a loose joint here. And what happens is that nerve on the side gets pinched again and again, gets damaged again and again, and that causes nerve inflammation. And uh, <coughs> these, this is, uh, the nerve is called peroneal nerve. Um, it's called the peroneal nerve. And oftentimes patients will have classical symptoms of CRPS type two going down their leg. <coughs> so before I go on to other things, I just wanted to uh, again reinforce, it's really important to know whether you have CRPS one or type two. Because if it's a type two, then there's a chance that we could probably find a fix for it. Uh, commonly used medications are gabapentin, pregabalin, melanocyprine, amitriptyline, and uh, duloxetine. None of these are impressive drugs. Uh, they're not really great. Uh, I wish they were, but they're not that great. They don't do a good job, um, but it's worth trying them. Um, they might give you some relief. They might give you 10% relief. In some cases, it does give more relief. Uh, again, I put it down as a yellow. That means there's no harm in trying it. Um, <clears throat> and you can see if it makes a difference. Uh, these drugs, um, Tylenol, um, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, steroids, not really helpful. But they're helpful if you have, along with your nerve pain, along with CRPS type 1 pain, it, there might be some joint pain. So for example, if I have CRPS in my left leg, I'm putting all my weight on my right side, now my right hip and knees start to hurt. In those cases, these drugs might make a difference. So they don't work exactly on the nerve pain part, but they work on the structural pain part. This is a, this is a game changer, low-dose naltrexone LDN. The, the reason I bring this up is because it's a disease-modifying agent. So like, remember I said, to treat pain, you need to find what's broken and fix it. And these, this is a disease-modifying agent. These drugs are not disease-modifying. So naltrexone, um, I think it's now been 10 years since we started. We found this drug. And it's, um, it's been, a, for the last 30 years, naltrexone has been approved by the FDA for treatment or something. I don't think any of you have. 
But when you take it in a small dose, hence called low dose naltrexone, one of the things it can do is it decreases glial cell activation. Remember we talked about how we need to stop those glial cells from getting angry. This is the drug to do it. Uh, so it, it stabilizes the immune system. That's how it works. So again, you see that same, same message coming back. Immune system somewhere here. This is just some science stuff. Uh, I don't, I'm not gonna spend time on it, but this is to, for those who are interested in understanding how LDN uh, works, this would be the slide to go through. Now, the practical aspect of low-dose naltrexone is the dose varies from 1.75 to 4.5 milligrams once a day. That's the critical part, once a day. That's really important. I usually start at 2 milligrams uh, per day and then uh, for a couple of weeks and then go on to 4.5 milligrams. Sometimes, um, some physicians may want to go a little higher than 4.5 milligrams, which is fine. You can go to 6, 10, 12 milligrams also, which is fine, as long as it's once a day. Um, in the initial stages, it can cause a bit of insomnia, some headaches, but those are all transient. They go away. That's the reason why I started in the morning. If you get insomnia, it helps. Um, <clears throat> but how does it help? It helps in increased physical activity. So it's very subtle the effect. It's not like you pop a LDN pill and all of a sudden your pain is better. The effect is very subtle. It takes weeks to see a difference. Um, so patients will notice, oh yeah, I can walk a little bit more or I can do the treadmill a little bit more. Uh, the flare-ups when they come don't hit the ceiling. They're a little lower. Um, the tolerance to pain is much better. Um, <clears throat> so most physicians who prescribe LDN recommend a trial of at least six months before deciding. My, my, my recommendation is to take it under, unless you have a super bad side effect, stick, stick to it. Um, it, it's, it, doesn't cause as, it doesn't cause harm, it's no harm in trying it, but it's definitely worth, because it could be the game changer. This is a disease modifying agent. This was a paper, I just mentioned it casually over here. We wrote about 10, 12, I think 2012 when, I, when we published it. Uh, where we looked at two cases of uh, patients with LDN with CRPS. But you'll find a lot more information on the RSDSA website. There's lots of information there. Um, there is a, there's an ex excellent group called the LDN Research Trust. Uh, those who are from this area, they usually have their annual meeting in Portland um, every year. So you guys can try that. But their website has a, has a tremendous amount of information. Um, <clears throat> this is another kind of a disease modifying agent. So CGRP, which stands for calcitonin related gene peptide, uh, <clears throat> what happens is it's a little chemical that's produced and we've known about CGRP for 20 years. So CGRP is a little chemical that's produced uh, when <clears throat> and during an inflammation. So it increases blood flow, it causes plasma to form around a nerve ending. And this results in swelling, heat, and redness, and pain, of course. So <clears throat> the idea was that, oh gosh, if we can block this chemical, we might make a difference, and surely they did. Um, it's been approved for the treatment of migraines. Now, migraines are quite something similar to CRPS. It's the same thing. Noise is sensitivity to touch. They, in fact, have allodynia to sc the scalp. And there's been a study that shows that people with migraines are prone to developing CRPS. So who knows, there's a relationship or not, but there is something, some similarity there. So what they did was they've done a bunch of studies on giving CRG, CGRP blocking drugs. So they made these designer drugs to block the effect of CGRP. And they're finding some phenomenal response. And the amazing part about this is that it has a very low side effect profile, extremely low side effect. In fact, the only side, it's an injection. In fact, the company, um, the FDA said that the only side effect is giving a shot. That's the only side effect, which, which sounded incredible to me. But anyway, there are three CGRP antagonists in the market right now. I mentioned three of them here. I believe there are two more coming out soon, or they're already there. Um, it's an injection, it's an auto-injector. You do it once a month. Uh, takes a few months to see a difference. Now, will it work for CRPS or not? We don't know yet because it's still a very brand new drug. It's just come out. It's been only a few months. We don't know. I've not, I've not had a chance to try it on CRPS patients, but it's worth trying it. 
The only downside is that it's an injection, and it's, it's a tiny injection, a lot like the, uh, like your auto injectors that you use. Um, I, it's probably, I think for me, I would, I would try it. So this is a, another disease modifying agent. So we've talked about two disease modifying agents. This is the third one. This is not really a disease modifying, but it's a disease altering medication. So again, the thought is that, you know, pe people with CRPS ha have, they have some sort of an auto antibody. They haven't been able to find it but they present a lot, it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it must be an autoimmune condition. So why don't we try and treat it like an autoimmune condition? So there are some centers that are now doing this and there have been a few studies, they're not great studies, they're not strong studies, but there are some patients. So I think that there is a subset of patients with CRPS1 who have an autoimmune condition. And so these people have bad antibodies, their antibodies are rogue antibodies, they're fighting their own bodies. So the idea behind doing an intravenous immunoglobulin in infusion, IVIG infusion is, why don't we give these guys a boatload of healthy, good antibodies from other people? And so they give that and then they see the response. So this, this is a whole different talk by itself. And this is one of the reasons why, why I went back to saying, seeing a pain specialist is one thing, but maybe seeing an immunologist might also give you some idea. I wouldn't go to an immunologist and say, you know, hey doc, I have CRPS, can you help me? Don't do that, just say, listen, I've got this painful condition, um, can you just rule out if I have an autoimmune condition here? Because I also have, whatever, I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or I have GI issues, whatever is associated conditions, which will help him decide. <clears throat> so ketamine, everybody's heard of ketamine, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. Ketamine is not, again, a disease-modifying agent. It's a disease-altering medication, but it's definitely worth a try. Um, so in the central sensitization, I told you how glial cells get all activated, right? But the other thing that happens is this, these receptors called NMDA receptors that also get activated. Um, these receptors, NMDA receptors, not only do they, what happens is they get activated, they, get pro they also proliferate. So the difference between me without CRPS and between somebody else who has CRPS, the difference is their NMDA receptors, they have tons of NMDA receptors that are out there, all very activated. And the idea is that if we can block these NMDA receptors, we might be able to control some of this pain. So <clears throat> it's, just to give you an idea about ketamine, uh, it's one of the safest anesthetic drugs that can be used. Um, it doesn't cause respiratory depression like you see in opioids. Um, it actually stimulates the respiration. It doesn't cause blood pressure to drop. It's a very powerful analgesic, even at low doses. The problem is that it doesn't get absorbed well when you take it as a pill. Orally, it doesn't work well. It only works well given IV or through the nose or as a sublingual or trochee. The good news is that it's been approved for uh, depression by the FDA. Um, it's the nasal dose that they've approved, which is a really tiny dose. I'm not sure how it works in depression, but it's been approved, which means that there are more and more centers that are now offering it, and eventually there, somebody, somebody in the insurance industry will turn around and say, okay, we can use this for treatment of CRPS, or at least depression. <clears throat> and so the, pro the only thing I need to bring to your, your attention is that ketamine infusions are good only if they are done in conjunction with other therapies. It's not just doing an infusion and sending the patient home. It needs a lot more other things that need to be taken care of at the same time. Because it's not, it's not a disease modifying, it's just disease altering. So it gives you that break in the pain that allows you to try other things and other remedies, or even be more active. <clears throat> um, it I personally think that it works best in low doses, not in high doses. More is not always better. We saw that in the example of naltrexone. Um, the lower the dose of naltrexone you take, the better the effect. Same thing with ketamine. The lower doses work better than higher doses, plus you avoid the side effects and the toxicities of ketamine. So it, ketamine blocks these NMDA receptors. Um, it decreases central sensitization. And like I said, it has to be done with other con things. There are, the protocol for IV ketamine is, um, there's something called a loading dose. It's given over 10 days. You start at a low dose and increase it as needed. 
Um, it's infused over four hours, and it requires full standard monitoring, which means blood pressure, EKG, the whole nine yards, and they have to have a qualified, trained personnel in the room at the same time, all the time. So this is, and the reason I bring this up is because there are so many ketamine clinics that are, that are proliferating. Uh, I, d I worry about if they're maintaining the same standards. So that's the safety issue here. Um, following the loading dose, um, the problem is you go in there, ketamine goes in there, it blocks NMD receptors, you feel great, but then the, they start to proliferate again. The ketamine gets washed out, it, the, the NMD receptors start to get active again, and so you, we do need boosters to top it off. Now, the boosters can be done um, one day or two days every four to eight weeks. It all varies on the patient's response. Um, it also varies on the season. For example, in our case, in the winters, we do it more frequently. In the summers, we space it or further apart because in the winter, cold makes the CRPS pain worse. So the protocol has to be, has to be customized, but it's not a one-time deal. It's, you do need boosters. The side effects are very, um, given in low doses, the side effects are very temporary and short-lived, and they're reversible. Um, nausea, vomiting, headaches is actually very common and then you can uh, get colorful dreams or hallucinations. And so these are some of the side effects, but they're temporary, they just come on for the day, and then they're gone after that. Oral ketamine, don't even bother, it's expensive, it doesn't work, uh, and you need to be on very high doses so you get to start seeing side effects from it. So one of the, pro one of the recommendations that I like to do is, you know, because ketamine IV is an expensive, uh, and logistically difficult uh, process, um, we start our patients on ketamine nasal spray or ketamine sublingual. Try that, so you can ask your physician, listen, before we do the IV, can I just try the nasal or the, sub, the trochee under the tongue and see what happens? And if you get some kind of a relief, even if it's a minuscule res response, that's a good sign that you can move further on to ketamine IV ketamine infusions. Um, if you start having super bad side effects from just one drop of ketamine in your nose, then maybe doing an IV is not a good idea. Um, the caveat to this is that if you try the nasal spray or the ketamine trochee and you see no response, even then it's worth considering IV ketamine. So the only situation would be if you get a bad side effect from it, don't do it. But if you get no response or a mild response, then it's worth moving forward with the IV ketamine. Uh, the reason being that the, the nasal spray does not give you a whole lot of ketamine. It only gives you a tiny dose. So it may not, it's possible that you may need more. But I don't recommend being on the nasal or the trochee for prolonged periods of time. Um, so if you are on the nasal, um, after a couple of months, we switch them to the sublingual. And then after a couple of months, we go back to the nasal. That being because Ketamine is a very irritating substance. Uh, it's an acidic substance. So if you use it continuously in your nose, it can cause nasal irritation. If you use it as a sublingual under your tongue, it can cause damage to your gums and teeth. So what we do is we switch around every few months. And you can ask your doctors to do that, switch, switch around a little bit. Um, <clears throat> sensory deprivation therapy, even though it sounds a little corny, uh, but it does work. It's an isolation tank. There are lots of sensory uh, deprivation tanks uh, around here in, in, the, in, in the US. This is actually basically a big tub, and it's filled with water, and it's got boatloads of Epsom salt in it, and so you sort of float on it, on top of it. You don't sink. You float on top of it, and they shut off all lights and sound, so there's no stimulation from outside. So when there's no stimulation from outside, the nervous system starts to dial down. And it does make a difference. I wouldn't say it cures CRPS, but it does help manage your pain somewhat. <clears throat> and again, it's not, a, uh, it's, not, it's not something that's going to fix a CRPS, but it can at least be that one thing that can add to your uh, help. Uh, spinal cord stimulators are electrodes. They take this wire, they, they thread it into your spine, or they can do a, uh, surgically put it in there, and then it's connected to a little generator. And the generator uh, then produces an electric current. Uh, you don't feel the current, you feel a little buzz, but the idea being that it stimulates, it, it causes something, we don't know what, but it's supposed to help with CRPS pain. And it, it's, it's got its upsides and downsides. I, 
I can't go into that. My personal opinion, I don't like to have it. I've seen too many complications from it, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. So moving on to desensitization. It's a very bad idea, really very, very bad idea. Now, the reason it's a bad idea is, you know, desensitization is, uh, the idea being when you go to, when you get your therapy done, they use a towel or they put your hand in a rice bucket and have you move around. Um, the last thing you want to do is stimulate that pain. That's the last thing you want. Because remember I showed you central sensitization, how the nerve impulse goes up to your brain and then, it, then there's a barrage of pain signals. You need to cut down those barrage of pain signals. By rubbing a piece of cotton towel on your arm is not going to cut down those barrage. You're increasing the barrage of pain signals. The idea that it came out was from is that they thought that when people have pain, they develop some sort of a phobia, a kinesiophobia. You know how you develop a phobia to spiders and they put you in a room full of spiders? And apparently that cures your phobia for spiders? I have no idea how. <laughs> Probably cures the phobia the spiders have of human beings, but definitely not mine. Anyway, so the phobia is that, oh, you don't want anyone touching it, so let's make you, let's, let's force it, let's force forcefully touch you and see if it makes a difference. Um, it's a bad, bad idea. The literature on, on desensitization is zero. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a piece of paper. So uh, physical therapy is extremely important. There's no doubt about that. But it's not the cure for CRPS. That's not how we cure CRPS. Yes, we prevent the muscles from atrophying. We prevent the joints from stiffening up, all of those things. Um, um, and and physical therapists who understand this do it very well. Um, just a few pointers, be very slow and paced. It's not, let's do a boot camp and things will get better. That's a very bad idea. You, your, your body's hurting, your limb is hurting. Don't want to torture it anymore. No pain, no gain is not, a, not, not something that applies over here. It's only when you join the Marines. Um, <coughs> unless you de decide to do that. But it's important to be consistent every day. So exercising one day and then not exercising for three weeks is not going to make a difference. I'd rather you do two reps a day for seven days a week than do 10 reps today and not do anything for two weeks. It, that's not helpful. Mental health is not a psychiatric condition. We know that. It's definitely not in your head. So if you find a provider who's moving in that direction, I would just quietly sneak out and get away. Uh, <clears throat> because then that just you're not getting the right treatment. That's the main thing. Um, it does cause a sense of despair. It does cause anxiety. Anything that painful will cause that. And it's reasonable to see a mental health care provider for that. And they can make a big difference in that. But to say that, oh, this is all, you're just making it up, it's in your head, that's harmful. This is not something that you can do from your head. And if you can, let me know. If you can make your left foot swell up or change the color in your hand, let me know. <coughs> I can retire. <laughs> graded motor imagery. Um, this is, uh, graded motor imagery came out from these neuroscientists, really smart neuroscientists in Australia. They talked about how the brain stops, it causes a neglect in your brain. So if your right hand hurts, the brain kind of just says, ah, we won't talk about it. And so it's getting that back into working again. There are three steps. <clears throat> so there are three steps, one, two, and three, and you really have to follow these steps. Can't jump to this one or jump to this one. Um, the good news is you don't need anybody. You can do it on your own. If you go to that website, gradedmotorimagery.com, they have the whole course over there, and you can do it yourself. But oftentimes I've had patients come back and say, you know, I tried mirror therapy. You can do mirror box therapy unless you've done these two. Unless you pass these two, doing mirror box therapy is going to be very hard. Um, Nelly Donate was a flop. Um, there was a lot of excitement because of that one paper that came out. Um, it's not been successful. In the UK, they actually stopped the study. And in the United States, the first study, the, the results were not, not good. Uh, they, they're doing a second study, and I've tried talking to the company, and they refused to re release the results. But it's not been successful. I haven't seen anyone get better with Neritronate. Vitamin D is extremely important, even though how small it sounds in the big picture, but vitamin D is extremely important. Um, it helps with your bone development. It helps with muscle and immune functioning. And so <laughs> it reduces inflammation. It's a simple thing to fix. Let's fix the simple things. 
instead of jumping to difficult and um, expensive things like spinal cord stimulators or ketamine or something like that, let's do the simpler stuff. Um, I can guarantee you most of us in this room are vitamin D deficient. <coughs> um, antioxidants, so when the body burns up, when the body does, does chemical processes that go on, and when you have a lot of chemical processes going on in your body, we produce garbage. We produce all kinds of trash, and those are called free radical scavengers. And these, this garbage, this garbage, are these incomplete cells called free radical scavengers are harmful, and you can treat them. <clears throat> Some of the drugs that have actually been shown to work in nerve pain are mentioned here. Four of them: alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, DMSO. It's a cream, and N-acetylcysteine. Alpha lipoic acid available over the counter. It's a free radical scavenger. Um, it does work well in diabetic neuropathy and other nerve pain conditions. And, and in Germany, it's actually one of the drug of choice for um, treatment of, uh, of neuropathic pain. Ideally, if you can get someone to give it to you IV, I believe there are some centers in the US that do it IV. That would be great. If not, then you can use the pill, take the pill. Again, um, the dose is 600 to 1200 milligrams per day. Start small and then start to increase it slowly. Again, I just want to tell you, this is not going to make one pill of alpha lipoic acid will not make everything all nice and good. It's a slow but steady process. <clears throat> Vitamin C is another antioxidant. This one actually has been shown to prevent CRPS. There are now three studies, three really good studies, two in the feet and one in the shoulder, where they have shown that people who got vitamin C before surgeries had less chance of developing CRPS. So the question now is, will this make a difference uh, to people who already have CRPS? And I think there's no harm in trying it. We know antioxidants do help CRPS pain. Why not do it? So it, at least prevent further damage. Definitely worth trying it. Um, the dose that they all used was 500 milligrams per day. Going any higher, I don't think it makes a difference. <coughs> Um, N-acetylcysteine is another one that's really, uh, I use it for people who complain of cold allodynia. You know how when some people with CRPS get this cold, dead limb feeling? I use it for that. It literally warms up that limb. Um, again, this is over the counter, you can get that, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, just to remind you, the green dot is effective, yellow is worth trying, red, I won't do it. Science is, the blue is science. Oxytocin, uh, oxytocin is a natural compound produced in the human body. Uh, it's, you can take it as a nasal spray or under the tongue. Um, it's helpful for flare-ups. When you have a flare-up, you can squirt some under your tongue or in your nose. It works directly on the spinal cord um, to turn on pain signals. It releases endorphins. Releasing endorphins is something that LDN also does. Um, I call this the NC10 rule. Um, this is, uh, the NC is the initials of my friend. Uh, 10 means that if you can get 10% from one remedy, say 10% from ketamine, 10% from alpha lipoic acid, 10% from physical therapy, and if you get five things that give you, each give you 10% relief, you've got 50% relief right there. And that's what we're looking for. <clears throat> so expectations from therapies is that even if you can get some small benefit from it, it, stay on it. It'll add up. Children and CRPS, this is a very uh, sore point. Uh, it's close to my heart a lot. People, uh, children with CRPS get really poorly treated. Um, in fact, it's so funny that an adult who comes in with CRPS, they'll give you a boatload of t pills to take home. A child with CRPS, they give you nothing. They'll say, put you into a boot camp physical therapy, brutal boot camp therapy, I have to say. And if you don't get better, then you're making it up. And if you get better, wow, our treatment worked. So <clears throat> that's the problem with, uh, and children need to be treated the same way as adults are treated. Um, and of course, if they don't get better, then it's considered to be a conversion disorder. And the parents insist on looking for treatments, and the parents get accused of something called Munchausen by proxy. Um, so. <clears throat> These are diagnoses that a psychologist takes years to come up with. It's not like they come up with one quick visit in the emergency room or on the floor. It's, it takes years of a psychologist, a psychiatrist, working with your treating physicians and saying, okay, we think that this might be conversion disorder. But it's not something that you make a di diagnosis in two seconds. 
And it should be done by a trained physician. You need to have a behavioral specialist. If it is conversion disorder, most, most, prob most likely, in, I've never seen it in my life. Um, so the difference being that children with CRPS, what we've seen is that they have joint hypermobility. And because their joints are loose, the nerves are getting stretched and pulled all the time. They may have a mitochondrial dis dysfunction. They may have nerve entrapment. These are some of the things that, are go that go on with children with CRPS. Uh, this is a quick note on uh, skin lesions. Uh, we're not quite sure why people with CRPS get these skin lesions, and they can be from pinpoint to big blisters. Uh, all I know about this is that ketamine cream works on this very well. It may not work on the pain as much, but it definitely works on this, on these skin lesions uh, very well. Uh, so um, service dogs, I think I saw one. Yeah, there's one. So service dogs are invaluable. Remember that these are not pet dogs. These are working dogs. They actually help with functioning and independence. They make you more independent. Um, they are there to comfort you both physically and emotionally. They can call for help when you're in distress. You fall down, you need some help. They can get you that help. Um, I have had kids go through college just because they had a service dog to help them through. So it's worth trying it. <clears throat> a quick note on pregnancy and CRPS. I get this a lot because, again, CRPS is more common in women. It does not affect fertility, um, so you can have a family. Um, in fact, during the pregnancy, the CRPS pain is a little better, but I would definitely t go to a high-risk uh, pregnancy center or delivery center for this. Uh, talk to your obstetrician. The question I always get is, is, should you go for a natural delivery or cesarean section? And there's no good answer to it, but I'll help you make one. Um, the problem with natural delivery is there's lots of pushing, and there's, which means there's more tissue damage. There's an episiotomy, episiotomy incision. The legs are put in stirrups, and there's a lot of touching, pushing, and moving. Like, people are screaming and yelling, and no one cares about anything. <laughs> I spend enough time in labor rooms to know that. Uh, so, CRPS, who cares? You know, just, uh, so, yeah, the leg with the CRPS is the one that they're holding the most. So. The other, the, the thing about cesarean section is that it's a surgical incision, which again puts you at risk for CRPS getting worse. Uh, there's no, but the thing is there's no excessive pushing. There's no pu pushing, there's no tissue trauma, there's no episiotomy, it's much more of a controlled uh, environment. And it's predictable. So my suggestion is to talk to the obstetrician and draw some limits. I'm not going to push for 10 hours, I'm just gonna push for a couple of hours. If I make progress, if I'm making good progress, we'll continue with it. If it's not, if it's not making things worse. But if in a couple of hours I don't see a great progress, let's go for a cesarean section. That's the kind of deal you may have to do, make with the, uh, but in any case, get an epidural or a uh, spinal anesthesia for it because if that makes a big difference. Surgery, patients undergoing surgery, uh, there's really no good answer. But definitely start vitamin C, 500 milligrams before, and just continue. For people with CRPS, just stay on 500 milligrams of vitamin C, uh, surgery or no surgery. You can start gabapentin or pregabalin if you want to a few weeks before the surgery. Ask the anesthesiologist. You've got to meet the anesthesiologist before the surgery and talk to him or her and say, listen, you can give me whatever anesthesia you want. Just add a little ketamine to your anesthesia. That's all we want. So they can do that. Um, it's becoming more and more common now. Um, the person who puts the IV has to be the most experienced person. It should be a one-shot deal, not digging around a lot. Look for an epidural or spinal anesthesia, especially if you have lower body surgery. Um, have a sign on your bedside, uh, on behind your bed. Have everything marked. Um, ask the hospital for a cage that they can put over your leg or your arm so that no one touches it. Have it marked everywhere. And if you're gonna be drowsy from the anesthesia part of it, then have an advocate there, you know, standing there with a, with a gun and anybody who touches your limb, <laughs> shoot him. Uh, I'm just finishing up here. Uh, palmitol ethanolamide, PEA, um, is now available in the US, it, both as pills and ointment. It, it, it's, it's pretty neat, I think it works, um, especially as a cream, it does work. I mean, if you have a small area of CRPS, then it really does make a big difference. Definitely worth trying. This can be part of your NC10 rule where you can, this could give you that 10% uh, that you need. 
Um, one of the things that we don't pay too much attention to is nerve pains, nerve conditions get worse if your blood sugar is not right. So it's really, really, really critical to make sure your blood sugar is right. Even slight variation in blood sugar um, can cause neuropathic pain to get worse. And so with this, I thank you very much. We'll